And apparently YouTube is recommending it to people as well. And I'm getting some hits from recommendations. <laughs> thinking, there's going to be some very disappointed people watching these lectures. <laughs> okay, I guess I better start. All right. So what did we do last? The last lecture. Do a quick little summary because we've all had a, a good weekend and forgotten all the math. We did some probability stuff. We did filtrations. We did conditional expectations. And we did the existence of conditional expectations, which is probably the most important thing for all Barnack spaces X. Somebody needs to mute themselves, by the way, because I can hear myself in my thing. Let me just mute everybody. Good. For all Barnack spaces X, for all integrable X valued random variables. So this is F in L1 of some probability space. I should say A measurable. So I want to emphasize the, the sigma algebra here. So for all A measurable random variables, for all sigma subalgebras B of A, there exists a conditional expectation. which I called E superscript B of F. And Tim pointed out that my notation is weird. Maybe it's probably more standard to write something like this for the conditional expectation. But I've copied my notation here from somewhere. I think Pizia, I can't remember to be honest. So this one is also used, but maybe not the most standard in probability. It's just in case you, you know, see this other notation, it means the same thing. So now that we know about conditional expectations and we know about filtrations, of course, we can talk about martingales finally. So let's define martingales. Given a probability space, um, and a filtration, recalling that I have this bullet notation for sequences of things. This is a sub n over n in the natural numbers. Given a Barnack space. What is a martingale? A martingale is a stochastic process with certain properties. So let's write that out. An x valued stochastic process, uh, which we denote f bullet again, using the bullet notation for sequences. The next value stochastic process, whose elements are all integrable. Let's say in natural numbers to be really pedantic. This is called a martingale. Uh, with respect to the filtration. Because we could change the filtration. If the following property holds, if the, the nth element of the stochastic process or the stochastic process at time n is the conditional expectation given the sigma algebra a n of the following element f n plus one. This has to be true for all n. So what this means is that at time n, your best, oh, what do I want to say? At, if you know the situation at time n, the best estimate for the situation at the following time is what you already have. Fn is the best a n measurable approximation to Fn plus one. Using this interpretation of conditional expectations, giving you the best approximation that's measurable with respect to a certain sigma algebra. I'll just quickly summarize that. Fn is the best An measurable approximation to Fn plus one. And in particular, I should just note 
the, the process F is adapted to the filtration A. Meaning that Fn is A and measurable, which follows from the fact that Fn is actually the conditional expectation with respect to An of something. It has to be A and measurable. So I don't need to assume that the process is adapted. It follows from the definition. And one question. Yep. Uh, when you talk about adaptive processes and you talk about uh, AN measurable functions, hmm. that means just measurable or strongly measurable? Because here it's clear because you're asking Fn to be in a one, but in yep. general? Um, in general, I, if I want, if I really need to say strongly measurable, I should say that. Here I don't need to say it because I already have that Fn is in L1. So it's strongly measurable. So by assumption here, Fn is strongly A measurable. And if you have that Fn is strongly A measurable and it's An measurable, it will follow that it's strongly An measurable by the Pettis okay. theorem yes. or by looking at approximations by simple functions. Okay, thank you. So it's a good point, yeah. But at this point, we don't need to think too hard about that. But maybe we should. It's not a bad idea to think about that. So this is the definition of a martingale. And there's an exercise in the notes, which I will say something about. Exercise 3. Point, is that a nine or a four? I can't read my own handwriting. Maybe it's exercise 3.9. Maybe it's exercise 3.4. I don't know. Three point something. 3.9. 3.9. Okay, cool. Thanks. I was surprised that it was that high of a number. I thought it would have been earlier. <laughs> So exercise 3.9 is about elementary properties of martingales. And I'm not gonna go through all of these now, but you should, after this lecture or when you've got time, you should definitely do this exercise. It's not particularly difficult. And it just gives you a little bit of practice in working with them. Do this exercise. But one that I will state uh, is that a stochastic process F is a martingale if and only if the different sequence df bullet, remember that dfn is fn minus fn minus one with f minus one being zero by convention. F is a martingale if and only if the different sequence is adapted to the filtration A And if the conditional expectation with respect to an of df n plus one is zero for all n. This is fairly straight, or this is completely straightforward by writing out the definition of the different sequence and using linearity of the conditional expectation. This is just a rewriting of the Martingale condition. So this df n plus one is f n plus one minus f n. And E A N of F N is just F N because F N is A N measurable. But did I assume that here? Okay, part of every exercise is troubleshooting the exercise. So, you know, if you find a mistake in the exercise, then you've you've won the exercise. I might have made a mistake here, but yes. Probabilists who can see this immediately, have I made a mistake in this statement? I'm hearing no issues. And Tim's shaking his head. No, I believe him. So, on the one hand, you can look at the stochastic process itself and look at the Martingale condition. On the other hand, you can just look directly at its different sequence and think in terms of that. And a lot of the intuition of Martingales actually comes from looking at the different sequence rather than the process itself. So, this property that the differences have expected value zero sort of tells you what a Martingale is. It tells you that you don't expect to see any difference at the next step. You expect things to stay the same. So let me give a key example. Not just an example, but a key example of a class of martingales that are going to be important in analytic applications. Christoph knows what this example is. What do I want to say? So we have our probability space. We're given that, we're given a filtration. 
and we're given a Banach space X. And I don't need to write what each of these objects are because you know what they are. Given F in L1, it's A measurable. For all natural numbers, we define F sub N to be the conditional expectation of F with respect to AN. So in this example, we're given a function. We're not given a martingale, we're just given a function and we're constructing what will turn out to be a martingale and with respect to a martingale induced by a function and a filtration. We say that F dot F bullet is the martingale associated with F and A. And to see that it actually is a martingale, this is a fairly straightforward exercise. Let's compute this conditional expectation at time n of the n plus one step. And so what we do is we write out the definition of fn plus one. We observe that when you take a conditional expectation of a conditional expectation using that an is contained in an plus one, because the assumption of a filtration is that the sigma algebras are increasing. You see that this is just the conditional expectation of the smaller sigma algebra. Think about it for a little bit, it makes sense. And by definition, this is F sub n. So this is the, the martingale property. If you look at the left and the right hand sides here. So F bullet is indeed a martingale. This is not really the key example yet. The key example is actually a, a sub example of this, where we take a particular probability space in a particular filtration. This is just a general procedure of constructing martingales and functions. It will turn out in a sense that all martingales actually have this form, but we'll see that later on. It uses an assumption on the Barnack space. It doesn't come for free. A key sub example is Haar expansions. I want to write that in red, but my tablet doesn't want me to. Haar expansions. So let's take our probability space to be the unit interval with its Borel sigma algebra and the Lebesgue measure. And from this point on, if I don't mention otherwise, if I take the unit interval, it has the Borel sigma algebra and the Lebesgue measure. Unless I say explicitly, I want to take the counting measure or something stupid like that. Well, let our filtration be the dyadic filtration. So just recall, if this is the unit interval here, then dyadic intervals are these intervals that look like this. This is a dyadic interval of length one. These are dyadic intervals of length one half. These are dyadic intervals of length one quarter and so on. And these sets generate the dyadic filtration. So AN, the generators of this filtration have length two to the minus N. And we get more and more sets as N increases. So this is actually a filtration. These are atomic sigma algebras. They're generated by a ni nice partitions of sets that have positive measure. And if you decompose them into smaller sets, well, you can't decompose them into smaller sets of the partition because it's a partition, right? Generated by partitions where each of the sets has strictly positive measure, two to the minus N. Now let's compute the martingale associated with the function and this, this filtration. Let's take F. It's a function or a random variable, whoever you like to think. X is a Barnack space. I haven't said what it is. It doesn't matter what it is, any Barnack space. So Fn is this conditional expectation of F. And in the last lecture, I think we computed what the conditional expectation with respect to an atomic sigma algebra is. 
it's given by the sum over all of the atoms. So let's say dn is the set of dyadic intervals of length two to the minus n. So dn generates a n. Let's write a n as the sigma algebra generated by dn. Elements of a n don't need to be dyadic intervals. They can be unions of dyadic intervals, right? Anyway, back to the conditional expectation. It's the sum over all of the dyadic intervals of length two to the minus n of the characteristic function of the interval tensor with the vector in X, which is the average of F on that interval. In case I haven't defined this average, it's here. So you take every one of the dyadic intervals and you replace the function with its average on that dyadic interval. What does this have to do with a higher expansion? Well, let's do some computations. Let's just note that every dyadic interval of length two to the n minus one, two to the minus n minus one, sorry. Every dyadic interval splits into two subintervals. Call them i minus and i plus, and they are dyadic intervals of length two to the minus n. So they're one generation up, they're half the size. And if I draw that, if this is the interval i, then this is i minus, this is i plus. i minus is on the left, and i is the union of the two. Now let's compute the difference, the martingale difference, dfn, on an interval i in the dyadic intervals at level n minus 1. So just a little note, dfn, this is a n measurable. So it's constant on intervals in dn. So if we take an interval in dn minus one, it's going to split into two subintervals, and this difference is going to be constant on each of these two subintervals. But in general, the value will be different on those two subintervals. We need to compute these values. So let's take the characteristic function of this interval and look at the, the martingale difference, and let's write it out. So let's start with the definition. And then let's write out what these things are painstakingly. So this first term, Fn, it is given by, well, it's got its constants on each of these two subintervals, and we know what these two values are. I'll just write it out. So on each of the two sub dyadic subintervals, it's equal to the average on that dyadic subinterval. We write it out like this. Then we have the Fn minus one term, which is just a constant on this interval. Like so. Easy first step. Now this can be simplified. Let's expand out what's happening here. If we look at this first term, which is supported on I minus, and we multiply it by the characteristic function over I, we just get the thing we started with, the characteristic function on I minus, because that's a subset of I, tensor with this average over I minus. We do the same thing on the second term. And the third term, we're going to take this characteristic function over i, and we're going to write it as the sum of the two characteristic functions on the dyadic subintervals, so that we're writing everything in terms of these dyadic subintervals. i minus plus i plus, sorry, i minus one i. Uh, not good to say these things verbally. There. 
so we've written everything in terms of these characteristic functions on the dyadic subintervals. And this will let us compute what the value of this function is on each of these two subintervals. Let's collect some terms. And here we have a minus. And we're going to write a minus here just to make everything look consistent. Or are we? No, we're not. Plus. Uh, F I. By the way, I'm always really bad at these computations. So if I make a sign error or something like that and you notice it, shout out and let me know. There's no guarantee that what I'm writing is correct. So now we can compare these averages that appear. We're looking at the average of f on the interval i and on a dyadic subinterval of i, either i minus or i plus, depending on which term we're looking at. Let's give, help, give ourselves a bit more space. So this first term, let's write it as the average over i minus of f. There's a, a dx or a D probability measure here that I'm not going to write just to save a bit of time. Did I forget the tensor product here? Yes, I did. Okay, that's just writing out the definition of the average. Now, what I'm going to do here is write out the, the length of I minus is one half the length of i. So this one on length of i minus can become two on length of i. Let me write it like that. And the same for i plus. So now we have some common terms here. What else do I want to do here? I'm also going to flip this sign and write these in the other order. So I've done things right. Um, my notes are a mess, sorry. <laughs> Let's not do that. Let's keep the plus for the moment. Okay, we're back here. Now this Average over i is the average, well, this, if we just look at the integral over i, the integral over i is the integral over i minus plus the integral over i plus. And we have two here of the integral over i minuses. So when we subtract the integral over i minus, we get one integral over i minus and minus one integral over i plus. So let's write that out. And we keep this one on i factor here one on length of i. We turn this plus into a minus to make everything look nice. And we do the same thing over here. And what we get is the same term as appears on the left. Like that. And if we do one last little step to make everything look nice, we take out a factor of one on, to make everything look nice and symmetric, we take this length of i and we write it as the square root of the length of i squared. We take out one of those factors. And what you get is one on square root of length of i, the function i minus minus i plus. Sorry, I need a i there again. There. So we get this function tensor with the integral of f against that function. So let's write that as f paired against one i minus minus one i plus over square root of length of i. You can just write that like that. Now these functions that appear here and the same function appears here, what does this look like? If this is i, then it's 
renormalized version of one on the negative part, the negative subinterval, and minus one on the positive subinterval. But it's renormalized and it's zero everywhere else. So it's a little square wavelet localized on i. And we call this function h sub i. This is the half function. on i. And its normalization means that its L2 norm is one. So we can write this out as hi tensor f integrated against hi. Good. Were there any mistakes in that? People shaking their heads, that's good. So what did we do? Let's summarize all of that. If we look at the difference sequence, DFN. We can write that as the sum over all dyadic intervals in DN minus one, the characteristic function of that interval times DFN, just taking a petition of the, the space. And using what we computed here, this is the sum over all dyadic intervals in DN minus one of the half function tensor with the Haar coefficient. This is a Haar coefficient, by the way. Whoops, wrong pen. So the different sequence of this martingale associated with the function f and the dyadic filtration is actually part of a Haar expansion of the function. So what we can do after that using a telescoping argument, we can write the function f as its expectation. This here is um, f0, the martingale term f0, plus the sum over n of its differences, ignoring convergence for the moment. If f is constant on sufficiently small dyadic intervals, then you're only going to have finitely many terms here. And you'll just, yeah, this will telescope up. You'll get the expectation plus the, the last difference that should appear. So this is a representation of f in terms of its differences, in terms of the associated martingale differences. And if we then write out what we know about this martingale difference, so let's write the expectation of f as the average of f on the interval plus the sum over n greater than one or equal to one, sum over dyadic intervals of the appropriate length times the, the Haar coefficients. And we can then notice that this double sum here, rather than looking at it as a sum over all scales and the sum over all dyadic intervals of that scale, we can just write that as a sum over all dyadic intervals of any scale. We just write that as i in d. And there we go, that's the higher expansion of f, or the representation of f in terms of its Haar coefficients. Haar expansion of f. So what's so good about this? This is a, a wavelet representation of f using these nice simple Haar wavelets. And so you've got all the whole wavelet theory behind you. This is like, you can look at local parts of f and look at how operators act on f in terms of how it acts on Haar coefficients or how it acts on the, these localized versions at a certain sort of frequency at a certain location, whatever. But you can also see this as a, a martingale difference representation of f. So this is a link between the theory of martingales and operators acting on martingales and wavelet theory in a sense. I don't, I honestly don't know a lot about wavelet theory. I'm just saying these words because they, you know, they sort of make sense, but yeah. This is nice and useful, particularly in harmonic analysis where we can represent a lot of interesting operators in terms of operators called Haar shifts that take a Haar expansion and then act on that. And so if we know how operators act on martingales, we'll know how operators act on things like Haar shifts and we can then bootstrap that up to other interesting operators. 
And if we know how well martingales behave with respect to a Barnack space, then we can start to do analysis in that Barnack space using the martingales. But we'll get to that later on. So there's two important words in this derivation here that are sort of glossed over and they are ignoring convergence. And one should not ignore convergence because convergence is actually the heart of analysis. It's the you know it's technical details, but the extremely important technical details that sort of make what the field is. So we're gonna stop ignoring convergence, think about it, ask yourselves the question, is the limit of F, which I've implicitly written as the limit of its conditional expectations, is this limit valid? Or in what sense is it valid or invalid? It's an important question. Um, it's a lot of time, good. Okay, let's start with the theorem. Just a basic convergence theorem for martingales. There, we're gonna do a few different convergence theorems for martingales. And most of them are gonna work in every Barnack space, but one of them is not. And that's gonna be an important one, but this one is gonna work in every Barnack space. So given your probability space, your filtration, your Barnack space, I might start writing given We let A infinity be oh, not this is a subset of A, sub sigma algebra of A be the sigma algebra generated by the union of all the sigma algebras in the filtration. Generally, if you're given a filtration, you can think of a limiting sigma algebra that's generated by everything in that filtration. This is the I guess the filtration that is determined, the, the sigma algebra that you can determine by only looking in the filtration. If you want anything bigger, you need to go outside the filtration. I'm going to call this A infinity. We're going to use this quite often. We let P be between one and infinity, not including infinity. Then for all random variables f that are in LP valued in x. We have that this convergence holds. The conditional expectations of f along the filtration converge to the conditional expectation on A infinity. And this convergence holds in the LP sense. Remember, convergence can hold in a variety of different senses. This is LP convergence. This is not pointwise convergence. Not yet, just LP convergence. It doesn't necessarily converge to F. The reason being that your filtration can be too small to actually capture all the information that's included in F. For example, if you consider the Borel sigma algebra and then you take a filtration, which is just constant, it's constant trivial you're not gonna recover F from that. <laughs> you have no hope of recovering the full Borel sigma algebra from a constant trivial sigma algebra. Or you can think of more interesting examples than that. But yeah, you, you do need this limiting sigma algebra here. The proof of this is nice, not too heavy, actually quite abstract. Without loss of generality, we can assume that A infinity is A. Or okay, I'm gonna write it the other way around because psychologically that makes more sense. We're gonna assume that A is A infinity. Because if we're working with a larger sigma algebra, we can replace it with the smaller one and we can replace F with the conditional expectation onto that smaller sigma algebra and everything is gonna work fine. So without loss of generality, let's just assume we're working with the limiting sigma algebra. It'll just make notation a little bit easier. Just write otherwise apply the result to this instead of F, instead of F. Sorry for the handwriting. So first what we're gonna show 
is that the union over all n of the LP functions that are an measurable is dense in LP, or in, or in, is dense in the LP a measurable functions. Remembering, of course, we just assume that a is a and infinity. Otherwise, this is not going to be true. Now, there's an exercise in the notes. Exercise 2.4, which everybody should have done already. Of course, you haven't, but you know, everybody should have done this already. By exercise 2.4, it suffices to do this for the Banach space being the scalars. So actually you have a nice little abstract proof that says if you have density of some subset of LP in the scalar case, then the corresponding subset is actually gonna be dense in the vector value case. You can go and do exercise 2.4 and see this. And this uses that P is less than infinity because the corresponding statement's not true for P equals infinity. Density things always break down at L infinity in the Banach value case. Let's consider the collection of sets that we pull out of nowhere. It's called curly C. It's the set of sets that are in A, such that the characteristic function of A is in the closure. I haven't written the closure yet, sorry. Is in the closure of the union of the LP uh, a n measurable LP functions. The idea is going to be show. The idea is going to be to show that C is actually A. <laughs> that all A measurable sets have characteristic function in this closure. If we assume the conclusion of this result, this is going to be true because this closure is going to be all of LP of A. That's what we're proving. But this is actually equivalent. This C being equal to A is going to give us that result. So what do we know about C? C is a sigma algebra. All of the countable closure properties that you need come from the fact that there's a closure in the definition that lets you make everything, you know, sigma closed, whatever, countably closed. C is a sigma algebra and contains all sets, uh, contains every, my mouth is not working today contains every sigma algebra a n by definition. If a is in a n, then of course its characteristic function is in LP functions of a n, it, LP a n measurable functions. And of course it's in that closure where you take the union over all n. Therefore it contains the sigma algebra generated by all of the a n's because this is the smallest sigma algebra that contains all of those sets. C is a sigma algebra, contains all of those sets, has to contain the smallest sigma algebra that has that property. This sigma algebra is A infinity by definition and by assumption that's A. So A is contained in C, which is contained in A. So A is C. <laughs> Great. So what does this imply? So all A measurable simple functions are in this union, this closure of this union because the characteristic functions are in there and the simple functions are just finite linear combinations of those. And it's a subspace, so yeah. And the A measurable simple functions are dense in LPA. Again, P is less than infinity. Well, okay, we're scalar here, so we don't need P less than infinity, but we need that for the extrapolation to the vector value case. So the closure of the A measurable simple functions, which is LP of A, is contained in this closure. And this closure is just LP. Well, it's contained in LP, right? And as before, this implies equality.
So this union of LP A and measurable functions is dense in LP A, as we wanted to show. Now that was just the first step, right? What do we actually want to show here? Uh, my screen's not scrolling, here we go. We wanted to show that the conditional expectations of F along the filtration A converge to F in LP for all F in LP, of course. Let's fix an epsilon greater than zero as epsilon likes to be. Then there exists a G, I will say here for all F in LP, got to quantify. There exists a G in LP of A N valued in X for some N, who cares which, such that G is very close to F by density of the union of these sets over all N in LPA. So we start by just ignoring F and replacing it by a, a close function that's actually in one of the, the sigma algebras in the filtration, well, measurable with respect to one of those sigma algebras. Now, if we look at the conditional expectation on AM of G, since G is AN measurable, we can replace G with its conditional expectation on AN because that it is its own best, you know, AN measurable approximation. And this will be equal to G for all M greater than or equal to N. As I said earlier, if you have M greater than N, then the smallest of these two sigma algebras, AM and AN is gonna be AN. So this conditional expectation will just be EANG, which as I said before, is just G. Basically, G is already measurable with respect to one of these elements of the filtration. So if you go further out in the filtration, you're not going to gain any more information by taking a conditional expectation. So this sequence of conditional expectations is stationary. It's eventually constant. So for all M greater than or equal to N, let's take the conditional expectation at M of F and compare it to F. We want to show this is small because we want to show this convergence. Use the triangle inequality. Comparing with the conditional expectation of G. Like that. Now for this first term, this is bilinearity, the conditional expectation of F minus G. And we know that the conditional expectation operator is non-expanding on LP. So this LP norm is less than or equal to the LP norm of F minus G. And we also know that the, for M greater than or equal to N, this conditional expectation of G is just G. So we get another F minus G here. And F minus G, is very small. So this here is less than two epsilon. Great, and epsilon's arbitrary. So let's finish the job, taking M to infinity. We have that the limb soup, I won't say the limit because we don't know that the convergence is valid yet. Limb soup as M goes to infinity, of the conditional expectation of F minus F is less than or equal to two epsilon and epsilon greater than zero was arbitrary. So you conclude that these conditional expectations converge to F in LP. And that's all we wanted to show. It's right on 11, so this timing was just perfect. Does anybody have any questions about those results or anything before the break? 
Well, there should be a sibling result, right? If the uh, martingale uh, Fn's are uniformly in LP, then you can guarantee. I mean, you started with an F in LP, and then you formed the Fn's, right? There yeah. should be a sort of one that bootstraps this F just from uniform boundedness in LP of the Fn. Is that right? That's the next lecture. Oh, that's the next lecture. Really. <laughs> that's okay. why you're the co-lecturer. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> You guessed exactly right. I mean, there's two things I want to point out about this result just before the break. One is that it doesn't depend on the Barnack space at all. This just holds for every Barnack space. The other is that, yeah, as you said, this is taking a function, creating a martingale from that function, and saying that the martingale converges to the function you started with, as long as your filtration is big enough. The converse question is, given a martingale that doesn't necessarily come from a function, is it converging to some function? Because if it does, then that martingale can be shown to have actually come from that function to begin with. And the, this sibling result that you refer to that says that this function exists does depend on the Barnack space. This one starts to become a geometric property of the really? Barnack space. And it turns out to be equivalent to the radon nicotine property. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm looking forward to the next lecture. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's not the next part of this lecture. I think that's actually ah, the next lecture okay, or right, maybe even right. the lecture after, but that's coming right. soon. That's yeah. what I want to eventually build up to, yes.